it's been known for more than 100 years that UVC light is very, very good at killing uh, bacteria and viruses both. And it's been used in, in many contexts over the last many decades. For example, in my own hospital's operating room, overnight, these UVC lights are turned on and overnight they kill all the uh, bacteria and viruses. And by the morning, you've got a nice clean room. So it's very good for cleaning any room. But uh, what you'd really like is something that continuously cleans that room while people are there. What I learned when I started reading Dr. Brenner's work was that it is UVC, a specific component that is best for viruses and bacteria, and that most of the UVC is filtered out by the ozone layer. Really what we want to do is be able to just reduce the ambient level of virus that's in the air in a group setting. And the problem there is that we've also known for a long time that you can't directly expose people to conventional germicidal UVC light because that would be a health hazard both to the eyes and to the skin. So really where we came into the story was to think, is there a type of UV light which we can use which would have the same killing properties, uh, virus and bacteria both, as conventional germicide UV light, but wouldn't have the safety issues. And what we came up with was a particular wavelength of UV light that we call far UVC light. It's around 220 nanometers in wavelength. And conventional germicide UV light is about 250. You might think that's a pretty trivial difference, 220 to 250, but actually it makes a world of difference because what happens at these lower wavelengths is that the UV light is actually absorbed in the outer layers of our skin, the dead layers of our skin. And this far UVC light, as opposed to conventional UV light, simply can't penetrate through this dead cell layer. So it can't reach the living cells in our skin. So it's safe. You can actually use it in rooms where people are actually hanging out and, and uh, doing whatever they're doing without it being a safety issue. This has been around for a, a decade plus. Uh, it has been worked on for, for longer than that. I, I was exposed to it 13, 14 years ago when it was installed on a piece of equipment over at NASA. In terms of safety, I mean, there are three approaches. We've got the, the physics of the matter, we've got the regulatory framework, and we've got a lot of experimental uh, studies now. David's really groundbreaking research showing that this set of wavelength, 205 to 222, was in fact safe for humans, has really been enormously important. This is not your grandfather's UVC. We grew up being taught to stay away from UV. This is a whole different wavelength, and that difference of only 23, 24 nanometers makes a world of difference on how our biological selves interact with it. And in fact, it does not penetrate us. It is not the same as we have seen with UVC before. So uh, we have to get that differentiated message out. We were really interested in influenza, and we were working on asking the question, can 5-UVC light kill influenza virus? Come the start of the COVID crisis, there was a light bulb moment where we saw pretty well immediately that what we were doing in the influenza world was absolutely applicable to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And pretty quickly, we were able to show that 5-UVC light is indeed very good at killing these coronaviruses. It's a 99% kill rate over 15 minutes. I think what COVID did is it really activated us to embrace how far we could take the science and how far we can push it uh, to understand what it would do to potentially disrupt this pathogen from wreaking the havoc it has wreaked. One sort of fundamental difference between this approach and an approach like a vaccine, for example, is this is one size fits all, that uh, the far UVC light or UVC light in general kills all bacteria and viruses, whereas of course a vaccine is very, very specific. We don't have long lasting immunity against the general coronavirus. Once you have this in, you don't have to worry about the next generation of viruses or mutations in the viruses. This gives us a much more direct approach in how we inactivate the, these viruses and pathogens, uh, but also doesn't create the downside of what's happened with pharmaceuticals in the past. We now have just one more tool in the battle against the transmission of COVID-19. 
when we're in a space, when we're occupying that space, uh, we don't want to have to evacuate it to clean it. We want to be able to reutilize that space in real time. The fact that this is cleaning both air and has some surface cleaning effects to it as well, that gives us the ability to, to dynamically utilize a space and to be continually reducing that, that viral and pathogen load in that space as we're inhabiting it. I think that's a, a strong differentiation between this and pretty much any of the technologies that are being discussed. We are continuing to introduce new products that utilize this technology. For instance, this is one that could be used in various settings. It could be used in hospitals, but it could also be used in homes or offices. It has both an optical light that could be circadian tuned, but also has an element on it that's a far UVC emitter. And that's all programmed in a light that could simply be turned on and off with a light switch. So if you can imagine that it could fit in this form factor, it can be used fairly ubiquitous. And that's the path that we're going down. There, there will be quite a few new products coming out. And there are a number that are already in the marketplace and shipping today. Offices, homes, uh, recreation areas, uh, all possible today already. We could have this in our emergency rooms. We could have this between us and our patients and really decrease transmission. I think this is going to be seen in so many areas. I think the health, the spa, any, any places where people tend to congregate. We're going to look at sort of those higher concentration areas first. I think as it becomes more and more available and more and more accessible, we'll see a quite a few additional application spaces, but the, the technology is also going to evolve into ways that it becomes more applicable and, and more friendly in certain areas. This may just be a practice uh, for the next pandemic and how we build this into our environment to make it more resilient uh, to these pathogens occurring is gonna be critical for how we move forward and we'll devise and design new form factors to accomplish that. 